Good morning. Good to see everyone. Happy belated or merry belated Merry Christmas to you. Let's stand as we sing hymn number 107. If you can find a hymn book, hymn number 107. Let's just praise the Lord. <clears throat> hymn number 107. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts toward heaven and praise the Lord. Now that we got the cobwebs out, let's do that again. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Good morning. Y'all want to sit down or stand up for the rest of the service? That's kind of what I figured. All right. That's kind of what I figured. Hey, man, how you doing? Good to see y'all. Well, Merry Post Christmas. Good to see y'all. Good looking. Jeff, how you doing, man? Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, how did it go? Did y'all have a good Christmas? Who got? <clears throat> okay. Can we talk? Don't let this go any further. How many of you got something you're going to take back next week? <laughs> <laughs> don't raise that. No, no, don't raise your. <laughs> I might can understand that, Mark. All right, good to see everybody. We are we're glad to be home. We got uh, we were getting ready to fly to Indianapolis last night. Two hour flight delay. Every flight coming into Florida was delayed, and so instead of leaving at eight, we left at ten. We got here at twelve. We got in bed at two fifteen this morning, and uh, so we're Stacy. She laying. Oh no, she's up. I thought she might. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, Jed, could you ever now and then maybe? Do, okay. All right. Good to see y'all. My good. Good to have Eric with. We've been praying for this young man. This is Paul and Brenda's youngest son. And uh, he just is, she's coming out of the turbulence of COVID and uh, pastor of a church up in Wetumpka, Alabama. Good to see you, man. I'm glad you're here this morning. All right. Uh, let's see. Who's got a praise report you want to share? Anybody? We got to see Devin and Nariah and the grandbabies and just had a great week up. It got down to nine degrees. Cold. Oh, it was cold as a mother-in-law's love up there. I mean, it was cold. It was cold. But we're glad to be back. It was, what, 43 when we landed. And I was like, ah, oh, this feels great. Anyway, good to be back. All right, who's got a praise report? Yes, ma'am. Amen. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, good to see Betty. Thank you. Uh, Eric and, and Jeff, they just got on a, a shirt. The <laughs> rest of us got sweaters and jackets on. I know our northern visitors laugh at us down here. When it gets into the 50s, we're in turtleneck sweaters and jackets, and then they come. I saw a guy at Menards the other day, and it was, it was like 11, and he's got on short sleeve shirt and shorts. And Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Man, that, that guy needs therapy. Uh, gee. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Good. That's good. Good, good, good. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Good to see Dr. Kelly and Ashley. Thank y'all for being here this morning. And I've got a couple, Jerry and, yes, I was going to see if you remembered your name. But I, that's what I was going to do that. Thank you. Thank y'all for being here. We're so grateful for your presence. All right. Anybody else? Jed, you look like you've got a, yeah, you've got a visitor with you. Good to see you. Now, how, how long are you down for? Okay. All right. Good to see you. Thank you for being here with us. All right. Anything else? Uh, thank you all for being here. I appreciate your presence. We're going to be in Isaiah 53 this morning. 
And I know we just, we've come out of Christmas, and it was on Friday. This is our national party every year. Uh, and what I think has happened as I have lived through the course of my life, we have pulled away from the significance of the day. It is now winter holiday. It's winter break for our kids at school. It's a, it's a good time to get a new pair of shoes. Or if you're a hunter, you know, get a new gun or new camouflage jacket or get to see the family, something like that. And I think we've sort of decentered this entire event away from what it's supposed to be about. And it's all about Jesus, folks. It's not about kids, although we love them. We hug them and we buy them stuff and we laugh when they open the presents and when they suck wind and get so excited. It ain't about that. It's about Jesus Christ. And so we're going to keep that as our center here. And uh, thank you for being here. Let's pray. And then we've got some music. And then we're going to be in Isaiah 53 this morning. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for even caring. You told us what not to do in the Garden of Eden. We did it anyway. We have broken every rule, every value, every principle that you have ever laid down in your book. These things were for our blessing and for our flourishing, and yet we have kicked them to the curb, and we've made up our own rules, and we've ruined our world. And I'm sorry for that. I ask your forgiveness for my part in that, and ask that you would bless our country with a sense of not economic stability, but of brokenness and repentance toward you. Thank you for those who've chosen to be here today. Uplift our hearts as we get ready to step into a new year. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Uh, same page, 106. Book 106. Praise Him, praise Him. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing of earth His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In His arms He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him. Jesus the crucified praises Jesus who bore our sorrows love unbounded wonderful deep and strong praise him praise him tell of his excellent greatness praise him praise him ever in joyful song Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud as hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Crown coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. All right, hymn number 102. There's something about that name. Let's stand as we sing. Hymn number 102. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. 
Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. That again. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all away, but there's something about that name. Amen. Good job. You may be seated. Thank you, sir. All right. If you're sitting next to somebody that just looks really sharp today, would you raise your hand? Every husband who's sitting by his wife better have his hand up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's good to see all of you. Jay and Linda Clark, good to have you folks with us this morning. Thank you so much for being here. We're glad you're here. And we're going to read the chapter in the Bible, the Old Testament, that is by far the most crystal clear prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ that you'll find in Isaiah chapter 53 where we're going to be Isaiah 53 I'm going to read these 12 verses and then talk to you about Bethlehem without Calvary and exactly what would that mean in our culture so Isaiah 53 if you there say amen if you not say wait a minute all right you got it If you go to the book of Jeremiah and turn left, you'll run right into it. All right. Could I get, Brenda, would you pull that shade down a little bit? The sun is hitting right off of the bumper of that car. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had that problem before. Yeah, I think you just pull it. There you are. Thank you, ma'am. Bless your heart. That's perfect. Absolutely perfect. All right, Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he, that is Christ, shall grow up before him, the Father, as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. He was not a good-looking man, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus was probably, in our earthly estimation, homely. So you wouldn't see him and say, oh, wow, there's the beautiful, lovely, handsome. You wouldn't see that. When we shall see him, there's no comeliness. There's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken. And that phrase means, to esteem him stricken means he got exactly what he deserved. And so the Jews thought this was a just thing, this crucifixion. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. 
and yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. There's not a person in here that would have done that. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of thy people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. In verse number 9, the word death is actually a plural word. Muth, muth is the Hebrew pronunciation. It means he died twice. And there's the physical death, and then there was the spiritual death that he experienced. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Ow. <laughs> That's his son we're talking about. How many parents do we have in here? Grandparents. Would you find pleasure in the brutalization of your child? He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, speaking of the resurrection. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. That is, forensically or judicially satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. We've just celebrated the birth of God into human culture, although more than likely a growing number of people are unaware of what Christmas is all about. We celebrate this as the very moment in history when there was this divine intersection between heaven and earth, God and men. It happened on this very night. If all of the prophecies in the Old Testament were liquefied, they would run down these sloping hills of Judea and they would pool in the manger in Bethlehem in the perfect fulfillment of the Son of God into human culture. However, there was a purpose for this birth that was beyond just an addition to a local family. This child was born for a wonderfully dreadful purpose. Now, he brought joy, I'm sure, to his mother Mary and his stepfather Joseph. I'm sure there was a sense of, we've got a new child this was a different child. This is a unique child, but a child nonetheless. It was a human baby that was born into this family. It was way more than just, well, we've got another mouth to feed. It was way more than Rome just wants another count on the census. It was way, way, way more than that. He was placed into our world to be the slave barge the garbage scowl on which was poured the filthy sin account of every human being that would ever exist. God put it on him and he took it to the cross and he died as us. That's what Christmas is about. Bethlehem without Calvary is just another birth, actually. Bethlehem without Calvary is just... Just another Jewish child into a world of Jewish children. Not a very significant event at all. Chapter 53 of Isaiah is the manger and the cross of the Old Testament. It tells us that God would enter human culture. Not as a full-grown man, not as a warrior, not as a, a champion, not as this muscled-up, smack-talking Jewish guy that was going to break the neck of Rome and <clears throat> throw the foot of the Caesar off of the neck of Israel. That's not who this was. Matter of fact, Isaiah, specifically chapter 53, was an embarrassment to the Jewish people. This can't be about our Savior. This, this can't be about the guy that's going to be our hero. This, this is, are you reading this stuff? Did you read what this was about? He's going to be ugly? He was going to suffer? Really? Champions don't suffer. Champions cause suffering. 
Champions going to deal some hurt. They don't get hurt. <coughs> and so, about 700 years before the star would stop in its retrograde motion, y'all watch that, I believe this last Wednesday night, phenomenal video on the star of Bethlehem. About 700 years before that happened, <coughs> God whispered into the heart of the most evangelistic of the prophets, and that is Isaiah. And he told him that this child would be hated. Well, who wants to hear about their child even before he's born? I mean, could you imagine the doctor coming into the delivery room and telling the mother in labor, everybody's going to hate this baby. Ain't nobody going to like this baby. This baby's going to be spat on. This baby, I'm telling you, your child is going to be a drag on human society. Who wants to hear that? <coughs> Excuse me, but 700 years before. Could somebody give me some water? Uh, <coughs> please, goodness. Uh, thank you, Jamie. We hate righteousness. And, and here's why. Because it's so unlike us. We don't like things that are different from us. We don't like people that are different from us. We don't like food that we don't like. You know, we, we don't like places that aren't like us. You know, we've, we've just been in Indiana. And there are a lot of Indianans in Indiana. And they love this kind of weather, you know. It's, it's cold weather. They, they just seem to thrive in this stuff. And you can wave and say hi to them and they'll look at you. Like, you ain't got a brain in the world, you know. And down here, I went to the post office this morning. And a lady got out of her car. I'd, I'd never seen her before. And I was getting in my vehicle, and she was getting out of hers, and she just looked over and said, hey, how are you doing this morning? I'm like, there you go. Well, here's, here's the Son of God <clears throat> born into our world. Wouldn't be good looking. Not going to be a rock star. He wouldn't have groupies running after him. He wouldn't, there would be no paparazzi snapping his picture. This was going to be a whipping post, a human whipping post. And that's exactly what Isaiah says was going to happen. He was going to be our burden bearer. I don't understand exactly everything Jesus experienced on the cross. Here's what I do know. I do know that the Son of God, bless your heart, my brother, thank you. Ah, oh, wonderful. That's not Snapple. <laughs> if you can imagine being, God being disguised as a man. We were talking about this in Sunday school a little bit. The birth of Jesus was almost like God tried to hide him. How would you introduce your child? <clears throat> if, if you were omniscient and omnipotent and your very word created <clears throat> reality, would you roll down golden stairs out of heaven and have all the spotlights turned on? Would the clouds become an orchestra and trumpet the entry of your son into this world so that everybody would say, truly, this is the son of God? We've got to believe on this guy. He didn't do that. He did it under the cover of darkness. He did it in a place where lambs were born destined for sacrifice in the city of Jerusalem. He did it quietly. He almost did it secretly. He disguised him in human flesh and not good looking human flesh at that. The one who came... <clears throat> all of the anger of mankind would be dumped on him. Again, because he was, <coughs> he was so different than we are. He was perfect, we're not. He was sinless, we're sinful. And so we absolutely despised his very presence. He came. What, what caused the crucifixion? 
normally the death sentence, you know, excuse me, the death sentence is saved for what kind of people? <coughs> who, do we, who do we execute? Criminals. And not just criminals. You can run a stop sign or you can break into somebody's house and be a criminal. <clears throat> they want to execute you for that. What do we execute people for in the state of Florida? Capital stuff, the serious stuff. So you, you can't get any worse than that. The Son of God was executed as a criminal. See, blasphemy was a capital offense in Israel. Just like in medieval Europe in the 14 and 1500s, did you know that <coughs> what they considered heresy was a capital offense? If you didn't believe what they told you to believe, you'd be executed. So here he was, guilty of nothing because he was God. Yet the Bible says that he became sin for us. Jesus was not a sinner. <coughs> he was sin. All of our sin accounts, now hear me, all of our sin accounts were assigned to one person. And that one person was the only person authorized to die and negate all of them because he was the only person that did not have a sin account himself. So he was qualified. See, I couldn't go up to Stark and say, hey, I've got a friend up here on death row and uh, just, just a real good buddy of mine. Could I, could I be executed for him? What would be the answer? No. What if I took his dog up? I mean, he just loves this dog. And go to the warden and say, sir, he, he, buddy, he just, he just loves Buddy. He's had him since he's a puppy. Could Buddy die in his place? What would the answer be? No. So that dog is not the same species. You see, I couldn't die for him because I didn't commit the sin. And there's no way to transfer his guilt to me. Buddy couldn't die for him because Buddy's a dog. Buddy doesn't even know the guy's going to die. He has no sin account. And so here's the son of God. He was arrested. There were six trials. Jesus endured six trials trials every one of them illegal if I remember correctly I think there were like 18 illegalities in in the trials of Christ Sanhedrin couldn't meet at night they met at night you couldn't execute anybody unless there were witnesses there were no witnesses I mean just, it was just it was a fraudulent thing that Christ experienced when he was interviewed could you imagine what crime are you guilty of? And Jesus would say, yours. What sin have you committed? These people have been stirred. This whole nation has been stirred against you. What have you done? What are you guilty of? I'm guilty of what you are. Now, this is sort of an oxymoron, and I'm aware of that, that God allowed this to play out in human culture in such an absolutely horrific fashion. And yet most of the world does not believe what I'm telling you right now. See, a Christian will tell you, if you don't believe in Jesus, you won't go to heaven. A Muslim will tell you, if you believe in Jesus, you won't go to heaven. And so, what do people believe? God's testimony. That's the very the question in 53.1. Who has believed this? Who? Who would believe that God became a man? Who would believe that? Well, it's pretty obvious that not many people believe that in our culture today. We can't do anything about our condition. Now, understand this. <clears throat> You do not die and go to hell for things that you have done. I want you to understand that there is no act. You know, murder will not send you to hell. It's, it's, that's not what. We don't get saved from what we do. 
we get saved from what we are. Because what we are produces what we do. And so when a person gets saved, you don't get saved. I need to get saved because, you know, I've stolen, I've lied, I've done, da, 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 da. We need to get saved because we are separated from God by our very nature. We are moral felons by nature. You can't do anything about that. What can you do about being a human being? <clears throat> That's our crime. How can you change that? See, I can change what I do, right? I can quit cussing. Man, when I was in high school and, and before, the, the air would turn blue. And I was a preacher's kid. I knew when not to cuss. <laughs> I did have enough sense not to do it around my mom and dad or anybody that they knew. So I knew that. And when I got saved, I lost about 85% of my vocabulary, you know. I was almost like a mute for the first few months of my salvation. Uh, I had to, had to learn a new way of talking. You know, a lot of criminals, they turn themselves in. And I've heard of stories, and I'm sure that you have too, of <clears throat> somebody does something or commit some horrendous, horrific crime, and they just can't live with the guilt anymore. And they'll go to the police station, and they'll, I'm the guy. I did this. Now, they, they come in and they voluntarily face their judgment. Jesus just turned himself into the authorities of the day. Could have escaped, but he didn't. He chose not to do that. He came in guilty of nothing. Nothing. Yet was the most guilty of us all. Because he volunteered to be what we were. All of us, folks, all of us. Uh, let me give you a really simple, maybe even a ridiculous illustration. Let's say this was a restaurant. We all ordered our meals. Now, we could all pay individually for our meals. Or somebody could say, ma'am, can you give me everybody's ticket? And one person could pay for everybody. Or you could pay for yourself. Now, what have you, have you ever had that happen, by the way? I've had that happen a few times. You know, the weights, by the way, pretty sure your meal's been taken care of. And, you know, I, I don't think I've ever said, no, 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 no. Oh, no. No, you bring me my, I'm paying my own, I'm paying my own bill. Well, that is a very poor illustration of what's happened here, folks. See, we each had the death sentence passed against us. We live on death row as unsaved human beings. And one day, that sentence will be executed. I have no clue when. It could be today. It might be in 50 years. I have no clue when, but we're all going to die physically. And the Scripture says that we're a terminal species. We... Um, it's been appointed, it's been designed, it's been embedded into us once to die. Once. But Revelation talks about the second death. What, what is this about? See, everybody's going to die physically. Every Christian's going to die physically. If Jesus came back today, and those of us who know Christ as Savior would be taken out of this world, we would experience death. Death just simply means separation. And so we'd be separated from the physical into the spiritual. That is death. Now, we may never experience the, you know, the casket and the funeral and the, the usual, but everybody's going to die physically. That is non-optional. Now, the second death is optional. Separation from the physical world um, is a good thing, really. Amen. All the sickness and the disease and all of that stuff is, is a thing of this world. This is, uh, these are markers and measures of this dimension. And in the presence of the Lord, there is none of those things. 
So all of that will be left here. But now the second death is when you're separated from God. Being separated from the physical world is one thing, but being separated from God is quite something else. There is no glorified resurrected body. You spend eternity in hell in the body you died in, whether that body is racked with pain and disease or whatever it is. And Jesus came to pay your bill. So I don't believe that. I don't care what you believe. I'm not being rude. I'm just telling you, you're going to die physically. Do you know anybody that has died in your lifetime? Anybody in your family ever died? It's pretty evident that death is built in to this world system. Plants die. Animals die. People die. People, however, are the only people that have spirit and that we will live somewhere forever. There, there's no such thing. There are some churches that believe in what's called annihilation. And the doctrine of annihilation is like there's a hell, but it's like throwing a piece of paper in the fire it's, and it's over with. Spirit or consciousness never dies. Never dies. It, it will exist somewhere forever. And so here was, here was Christ. We just, oh man, isn't it, Christmas is wonderful. It's just great. If, if you're like the average person, <clears throat> you like to get stuff. And maybe you even give people a list of stuff you want to be surprised by. Oh, you didn't. Oh, my word, you didn't do that. You didn't have to do that. Oh, yeah, they did. You know they did. <laughs> you know that that list was not a suggestion. That's what you wanted. And we, we enjoy that. I, we sat around the living room the other day and, and uh, Lily and Lexi were opening their stuff and sucking wind, you know. <gasps> ooh, ah, ee, ooh. And as soon as they got that open, they'd throw it away and get another. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It was just this, like this chain link thing going on. And um, th that's the joy, you know, the older you get. That's, but that's a wonderful experience. Why don't we decorate with lights? Why don't we give gifts? Because Jesus was the light of the world. Every light on your tree, every light on your house is a symbol that Jesus came into a world of darkness to give light where there was none. And light just simply means truth. We give gifts. That's not the only time of the year that we give gifts, birthdays and anniversaries, and I'm aware of that. But, but the, the big thing about Christmas is a Christmas gift. And we put them under the tree. How many of y'all, when y'all were kids, would pick your box up? Anybody ever do that? You'd shake it and turn it. You wanted, it sounds like, you know, and then, oh, mom's coming. You know, and you put it up and, and uh, you wanted to know what your stuff was. We had a family tradition that, as a kid, I didn't appreciate. Now I love it. My dad was a preacher. I was a PK. We opened our stuff on Christmas Eve. That way, Mom and Dad could sleep later on Christmas Day. I know now what that was all about. But we'd all sit around, and I, I had all my stuff. I, I had it located. You know what I'm saying? Jimmy. The most important name under that tree was mine. And I had all my stuff located. No, we're not going to open them right now. What are we going to do? My dad would get his Bible. And he'd read Luke chapter 2. Longest chapter in the history of the world. He would read the Christmas story in this deep, baritone, ever so slow voice. I'm dying, you know. And now, wow, that's what it's all about. And so we give gifts because God gave the greatest gift. He gave us Bethlehem. Just a little knot in the road. 
It's just small, insignificant. I mean, nothing comes out of Bethlehem. But that's where Christ was born. The greatest gift. Now, we don't give ugly gifts. We don't, we don't give things that people don't like. The Jews wanted a Messiah. They wanted him gift-wrapped in gold foil. They wanted him muscular. They wanted him to look like King David with the arms of Samson. And, you know, they wanted it, all the great leadership skills of Moses. And he's going to be the compilation of everything wonderful about Jewish history and culture. That's going to be, he's going to show all y'all. Y'all wait till he comes. And then he came. And it was like box car Willie. Whoa, 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 whoa. No. Oh, no. No, no, no. And he came into his own. His own received him not. No, you're, no, get out of here. Who's your daddy? Was well, Joseph the carpenter? Who's your mama? Was well, he, you know, I mean, just, nothing added up. But it all added up if you go back to Isaiah 53. It all added up. The Lord told them, this is what he's going to be like. He will be so holy, you will hate him. The beauty of his deity will be covered in humankind to the point where you will not even recognize him. He will be so much God, you won't recognize him as a man. He will be so much man, you will not recognize him as God. But he's going to be your savior. This is... This is who's going to come. Now, as a matter of fact, let's wrap this up. Look at verse number 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord. You talk about retribution. Vengeance. Anger. God hates sin. So what did he do to it? He beat it to death. He hates sin because it has ruined us. What did he do? He killed it with all of the fury of divine power and judicial authority. He took his sword of justice and he sheathed it in the side of his son. And he was judicially satisfied. He pleased his own sentence. It pleased God to bruise him. Then scripture says that he was made an offering for sin. The word offering there, it's the word for the sin offering that the Jew was required to bring. Did you know that the sin offering required a 120% restitution? 100% wasn't enough. You had to give more. Jesus was your And my sin offering. The Bible says this. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. In other words, if you get a cut, how big is a bandage? Remember when you were a kid, you wanted the biggest band-aid possible. Get a little scratch. I wanted everybody in town to know I was hurt. You know, the girls at school, oh, oh, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, (laughs) It was pretty massive. It was pretty big, you know, a little scratch. And, and you know, the point is this. However broad your sin is, grace covers your sin so much more. Did you know that legally there's more grace available than is required to save you? Can I tell you this? You're oversaved. You're more saved than you need to be. The grace of God. My goodness. Nobody could do that but Jesus. I couldn't even pay for my own sin. You say, well, what do you mean by that? How long is a person assigned to hell? Forever. How many of you would go in and, you know, you're signing papers on a new house? Well, what? What, will, what are the, the numbers here? Well, it's uh, $2,700 a month. For how many months? Forever. Well, you know, I appreciate your time, sir. I think we'll find another lending institution. 
You can't pay your sin debt off. That give you any idea how much we owed God that our sin account could never be paid off? Ever? But in one afternoon, three hours on a cross, Son of God paid it all. Where your sin abounded, grace covered it all. There was restitution. Now we're not through. Look at the last phrase in chapter 53, verse 10. He'll prolong his days. We're talking about resurrection. So we're not retribution, restitution, and resurrection. Jesus did something that had never been done before. He just defeated death. I mean, death just doesn't lose. You understand that? It doesn't lose. It was like Miami in 1972. <laughs> they just didn't lose. Jesus is crucified, and, and I, you've heard the swoon theory. There are so many explanations, faux explanations for, for the resurrection, and, and one of the dumbest is the swoon theory. We well, lost a lot of blood on the cross, you know, and he just passed out. So they pulled him off the cross, and they put him in this cool grave. And they wrapped him up in all this cloth because the Jews did not do what the Egyptians did. They didn't embalm a body. They didn't drain it of fluid and they didn't do that. They just covered the stink with cinnamon and spices, you know. I mean, they basically just made French toast out of you and wrapped you in these cloth like a mummy. And then that stuff was hardened. And, and then somehow, we don't know how, this is swoon theory. He's passed out. Oh. Put him in a tomb. And somehow he came out of those mummy claws. It was still there when the women went in. But somehow he just got out. We don't know how. And then there's a theory of, oh, they went in the wrong tomb. And then there's a theory of, oh, all the Roman soldiers went to sleep and the disciples came and rolled that 20-ton stone away from the hole. Nobody heard it. And they got him out and buried his body somewhere. All kind of, well, let me, can I just cut to the chase and tell you, he rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. All right. And when they did go in, you know what they found? They did find that the mummy, it was there. It was empty, but it was there. And death, you talk about could you imagine headquarters in hell getting a phone call? Um, I don't know how to tell you this, but you know that troublemaking Jewish preacher? Well, it seems though we've misplaced him. Did we talking about you misplaced? He's gone. He's not in the inventory anymore. But he rose from the grave. Now, death is a toothless old man. All of its venom has been drained from its fangs. All of it. You know what death is now? It's this old garden keeper that opens the door and lets you out of life and into the presence of the Lord if you're saved. Has no power, no... Don't fear death. Don't fear death. See, Satan has no authority. If you're a Christian, Satan has no authority in your life. The only authority he has is the, the authority that we cede to him. We, we give him authority. Don't do that. Bethlehem without cower. Just think about it. Bethlehem. Great. Wonderful. Angels. Son of God. Birth. Wonderful life. He, he healed and did all of these marvelous things and then he's crucified and he's buried and four days later still know Jesus out of the grave. Five days later. A week. A month. Two thousand years. Body still wrapped in clothes in a grave. 
borrowed that had become permanent. You imagine Bethlehem without Calvary. But praise the Lord. Calvary followed Bethlehem. And we stand today. If you're not saved, you have the blessed opportunity to say, Lord, there's nothing I can do about this. I can be as good as I want to be and still die and go to hell. I can be as moral as I know how to be. I can be a professional religious guy like the scribes and the Pharisees were. And Jesus said, if your righteousness does not exceed these guys, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not about what we do. It's about what he did. It's what he did. If you died right now, would you go to heaven? And if not, may I ask you, why? What are you waiting on? What else does God have to do? Famous atheist was being interviewed one time about his relationship and his, his disbelief that there was a God. And the interviewer asked him, said, now when you stand before God, if there's a God, you stand before him and you never believed, what, would, what are you going to say to him? And this fool of a man said, I'm going to say to him, you didn't give me enough evidence. You didn't give me enough evidence. I can look in the eyes of every person in this building and I see evidence. There's a God. I can walk out those front doors and I can see grass growing in the yard. I see evidence. There's a God. I can look up in the heavens and I can see precision and I can see beauty and I can see evidence that there's a God. I can read this book and I can see evidence that there's a God. You have no excuse. Can I just cut to the chase and tell you, you have no excuse. Would you bow your heads? Lord, I'm grateful for Bethlehem. It had to be. I'm also grateful for Calvary. It had to be. You became what we were. You were guilty of our sin. You were bruised in our place. I don't know how to thank you for that. And my prayer is if there is one human being in this building today that has never accepted your payment for their sin, they would not walk out of here with their sin account in their own name. But that by faith it would be transferred to the holy and righteous Son of the living God who paid that price for us all. Lord, that's my prayer. Save those today that don't know you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand? If you've never trusted Christ, I'm going to ask you, just come down here. We'll have somebody with the Bible show you what you need to do. It's really, really simple. It's already been done. Thank you so very much for being here today. I appreciate it. And all of our visitors, you're down here for just a few days or a few more weeks. Thank you all for being here. I know you could have done a hundred other things today, but you chose to be here. We appreciate that very much. See you guys Tuesday night, right? All right. Looking forward to it. And let's bow and be dismissed. Eric Sutton, brother, I love you.
You are my dear friend, and I am so glad that you're here with us. Would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Mourns in lonely exile here.